Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. Dr. Luke's account of Jesus feeding 5,000 men was the focus of our last lesson, and that number doesn't include women and children, so he could have supernaturally fed around 20,000 people. In chapter 9, verse 17, we are told that the people all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. We are told that the people ate and were satisfied. This reveals that there was enough food to feed the people to the point that everyone present was totally satisfied. The leftovers were so abundant that the disciples gathered 12 basketfuls of bread. We don't know how much a basketful could hold in that era, so we can't accurately estimate how much food they gathered. It was common for Jews to take a basket with them on journeys to hold their food and travel needs. This was particularly important if they were passing through Samaritan or Gentile territory, since they wouldn't eat food that was potentially offered to idols or was somehow unclean. John's Gospel gives us some more information on this event, writing in chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. When they had all had enough to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. God incarnate manifested his divine power by multiplying five loaves of bread and two fish to feed 20,000 people. He could have done it without any bread and fish, and an example of this is seen in what he did for the Israelites who were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. I think an important reason why Jesus used the small, simple fare the disciples had was to show them that he can multiply what little we have to offer. Though God can do whatever he pleases without our help, he has established that we must play an integral part in spreading the good news of the kingdom of God. Though we have little to offer, he can do great things through our weak faith. The miracle comes from God, but we must have something of substance for God to work with or he will withhold his power. Looking further at John's account of this event, he went on to write in verses 14 and 15, After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The people knew that they had experienced a miracle and thought that Jesus would make an awesome king, especially in comparison to Rome and the Herod family. Yet they were thoroughly selfish in their motivations. They thought it would be great to have a king that could feed them like the Lord did for Israel in the wilderness. Such a king could surely deliver them from Roman oppression. It's strange that the people knew Jesus performed a miracle, yet refused to listen to his preaching or obey his word. They wanted to use Jesus for their own selfish agendas. The miracle revealed that Jesus operated through divine power. Though they wanted that divine power working for them and for their nation, they wanted it done their way, not Christ. They had in mind the things of man, not the things of God. In stark contrast stands Jesus, who only wanted to do the Father's will, and that's exactly what he was doing here. According to the Gospel of John, the very next thing Jesus did was to walk on water on the Sea of Galilee while a storm was raging. This is followed by Jesus preaching his important sermon on his being the bread of life. That's found in the rest of chapter 6. Luke doesn't follow an exact timeline like John does, since he chose to record the life of Christ by dividing his history into categories, as I have said before. Now let's move on to verses 18 through 22, where we will see that Luke gives another one of his generic statements on when this event took place. He wrote, Once, When Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? One important agenda Dr. Luke had in writing his gospel was to establish the validity of each event and the life of Christ on the whole. Rather than holding to a strict timeline, he was often generic in telling us when the event would happen, and this is why he used the word once. The doctor didn't establish the setting of this event other than stating that it happened while Jesus was having a time of private prayer. At times, Jesus went by himself to commune with his father, but this time he brought the disciples with him so they could learn how to pray. He also had another agenda, as we will soon see. 
Jesus knew what the people were saying about him, but his simple question would lead into asking a second question, and this is where he really wanted to take his disciples. He went from a general question about what the people were saying about him to one that was very personal and confrontational. This is something that Jesus often did and always did for the good of those to whom he was ministering. This also marked a major change in what Jesus was teaching his disciples. From this time on, Jesus began to reveal what would take place in Jerusalem at the hands of the chief priests and Romans. Think of this as a process that's similar to training children. You can't take a young child who's only begun going to school and teach him advanced algebra trigonometry. Parents and teachers have to start at the basics and move up from there. They can also only progress according to the child's ability to comprehend what's being taught, and this would also include their desire to learn. When Jesus began his ministry, he started gathering disciples around him. He began by teaching the basic truths of the kingdom of God. An important part of their training at this time was to closely watch what Jesus did so that they could imitate his life and ministry. As they matured in the faith, he began giving to them more to learn and do. Now that Jesus was nearing the end of his earthly ministry, it was time to prepare the disciples for his sacrificial death. This was something that they would have never been able to comprehend at the beginning of his ministry. It took much preparation until they could handle this truth, and even then they weren't ready for it. To prepare them for this truth and what they would go through, Jesus needed to cement in their minds who he was, at least as much as they could comprehend at that time. At the very least, they had to thoroughly believe that he was the promised Messiah. But Jesus was taking this further by proving to them again and again that he was divine. Jesus began informing them about the coming events so that they would see that everything he did was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about Messiah. By understanding this and encountering the resurrected Jesus, they could take the next leap of faith to grasp the mind-boggling truth of Christ's divinity. This truth was made evident to them in a host of ways, but it was hard for them to get their frail, finite minds around. When I think about the setting where this took place, I imagine that it happened after a hard time of ministry. Jesus took the disciples into a solitary place for a time of refreshing prayer and some much-needed teaching. They were exhausted, yet filled with joy over all that they had seen and heard. This may have taken place in the evening when they were gathered around a campfire to eat a meal, and their conversation was filled with all the miracles they saw and the response of the people to Christ's teaching and miracles. This must have been a joyful time with laughter, jokes, and storytelling until Jesus broke into their conversation, and then everything began to change. The disciples responded to Jesus' question in verse 19 by saying, some claim John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Their answers seem jovial as they recount what people said to them about Jesus and who they thought he was. One idea that must have been spreading was similar to what King Herod believed, that John the Baptist must have raised from the dead and that signs and wonders were taking place as a result. Others said he must be Elijah, and this probably came from people who were more knowledgeable of the scriptures or the teaching of Messiah that was prevalent in that day. Some claim that Jesus was one of the Old Testament prophets who had come back to life, even though they had no biblical basis which to make such a claim. One way or another, Jesus was a hot topic throughout Israel. Then in verse 20, Jesus gets very personal. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Jesus always confronts us over what we believe, how we live, and what we are going to do with the truth that we have been given. The truth is always confrontational because it exposes the lies we believe and teaches us how we should live in this wicked world. Since Jesus is the truth, he will confront us over our sin and wrong ways of living, thinking, and loving. To believe in the existence of God isn't enough, nor is it enough to believe that Jesus is God. We must have faith in who God is as he has revealed himself to us through the Holy Scriptures. People's opinions about God may damn them to hell. It's only the truth that will set us free. Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say I am? To bring to light whether or not they were believing the truth or deceived by lies and opinions. Jesus knew that the disciples believed he was the promised Messiah, but this question forced them to vocalize what they knew to be true and to commit themselves to what that meant. I don't doubt that there was a lot of fear in the disciples and that they were afraid to be the first to say what he believed. They were probably looking at each other to see who would be the first to speak, and when they looked at Peter, he finally spoke up to their great relief. 
Simon answered Jesus, not because he was the head of the church or their spokesman, as many have erroneously claimed. It's just that he was more outgoing and was quick to speak. Yet when he proclaimed that Jesus was Messiah, he also spoke the mind of the other disciples. In verse 20, we also find Peter's answer to Christ's probing question, where he declared that Jesus was the Christ of God. Peter acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah sent from God. How much Peter and the disciples understood of our Lord's divinity is hard to determine, so we need to glean the truth from some other verses to help us with this matter. Peter knew Jesus was sent by God and that he was the promised Messiah, but he probably still held to the typical view of Messiah at that time, or at least some version of it. Jesus' teaching on Messiah and his mission would have helped the disciples veer away from the common views of the day, yet he could only teach them as much as they were able to understand at that point. The pop view was a mingling of the Old Testament prophecies about Christ's first and second coming. There's a good possibility that the oral traditions of the rabbis were integrated in this as well. It took Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension for the disciples to differentiate between Messiah's first and second coming. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, we are given the fuller answer from Peter, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here we are given a little more substance to what the apostles said, and this is a very concise statement. This reveals that Peter was thoroughly convinced that Jesus was Messiah. Now let's try to understand what Peter meant by stating that Jesus was the Son of the living God. The Coptic and Persian versions of Luke's Gospel translated the Greek, Thou art Christ God, which clearly relates to Christ's divinity. There's an event that happened prior to this that shows the disciples were growing in knowledge of who Jesus was. The count is found in Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, where we are told, Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This happened after Jesus walked on the water, then calmed the raging storm. As Jesus approached the boat, Peter asked to walk on the water to him, and the Lord bid him come. After a few steps on the water, Peter fell into unbelief and began to sink. Then he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus loves to respond to such heartfelt cries, and he reached out a hand to rescue Peter. He also rebuked Peter for his unbelief. After Jesus entered the boat, the storm was immediately calmed, and the boat supernaturally ended up at its desired destination. The disciples had a glimpse of Christ's divinity, and they spontaneously began to worship Him once they reached the shore. I think by this time most of the disciples had come to believe that Jesus was Messiah, but were afraid to say so. As Jesus performed other miracles, the disciples were beginning to grasp to a limited degree His divinity. Returning to Luke chapter 9, we are told in verse 21 that Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Notice that Jesus didn't deny Peter's declaration, since it was the absolute truth. From this point on, the Lord begins to teach the disciples that he would die in Jerusalem for the sins of mankind. He didn't want the truth of his divinity coming out too soon to provoke the religious Jews. They may have tried to crucify Jesus before the appointed time. After Jesus rose again and ascended back into heaven, then the truth of his divinity must be boldly proclaimed so that its import could be understood and applied to the life of repentant sinners. In verse 22 we read, And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Matthew adds to this in chapter 16, verse 21, From that time on Jesus began to explain to his disciples, Though Jesus had been moving towards the cross from the day of his incarnation, this marks the change in our Lord's ministry. He had gathered a band of disciples and raised up twelve of them to be leaders of the church after his ascension. He was literally moving towards his substitutionary work on the cross. As Jesus proved that he was Messiah and revealed his divinity, the next phase of teaching had to incorporate the ultimate purpose of his coming to this rebel planet. Now Jesus begins to show that the Son of Man must suffer as an atoning sacrifice. Through this we learn that there is no other way for Jesus to accomplish the redemption of mankind. Over the centuries, many have questioned why Jesus had to die on the cross, claiming that there must have been another way to save mankind. But there wasn't. According to the wisdom of God, the plan of redemption was set in motion before creation came into existence. The Lord wove through the Mosaic Law and the words of the true prophets that redemption would come through a suffering Savior who would bear our sins. As a result, there was absolutely no other way that the sins of the people could be atoned for. Before that terrible day when Christ was crucified, he wept in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. The anguish was so great that we are told that he sweat drops of blood. 
Jesus understood the terrible physical suffering that he would experience, and this must have added to his grief, but only to a limited degree. Then there was the knowledge that he would bear the guilt of mankind's sin, and this was crushing, as Isaiah 53 reveals. The Lord knew the vast extent of evil that he would take upon his perfect, innocent self so that we could be pardoned. But the horror of all horrors was his infinite knowledge about the wages of sin that produce separation from God the Father. Perfect, indivisible unity exists within the Godhead, yet the Godhead would experience a separation when the Father rejected the Son, not as the Son himself, but as our substitute. We have no ability to comprehend the utter anguish and terror the Son experienced when he was separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit. An eternity in hell for unrepentant sinners would never compare to what Jesus suffered for us through that separation. He suffered the full, unrestrained, just wrath of the Father as he bore the sins of mankind upon his sacred shoulders. This wasn't the sins of one person, but of all of mankind's sins combined throughout the ages. Only God the Son could endure the infinite wrath of God the Father. Yet even as I speak this truth, I can't wrap my mind around it or explain how it could happen. How could the Father and Son be separated since they are indivisibly one? And how could Jesus endure the unrestrained wrath of the Father? Yet he endured all this and was crushed under the weight of our hideous evil sin so that we could become the righteous children of God and spend an eternity with him in heaven. What the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law did in betraying Jesus and giving him over to the Romans to abuse and crucify him was nothing in comparison to the suffering he endured so that we could be saved. Paul said this so aptly in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What Jesus told the disciples is highlighted in verse 22, where he would suffer and rise again. What good is it if we have our sins forgiven, if there's no hope of eternal life? Yet the life I have in Christ far surpasses that which I lived in my unsaved condition. The distance is as great as the earth is from the sun. Even if I didn't have the hope of eternal life, the life I have in Christ makes serving him worth it all. The good news is that we have the sure hope of eternal life if we remain faithful to Jesus to the end of our days. The Lord wanted the disciples to understand the power of his resurrection as much as they could at that point in their faith. The disciples would go through three days of agony, beginning with Christ's crucifixion and death. But on the third day he would rise again from the dead, and they would have greater joy than ever before. It's easy for us to say that the disciples should have had some concept of Christ's resurrection since they had seen him raise people from the dead. This proved that he was Lord over the spirit realm. When life gets hard and we suffer many trials, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus and fan in the flame our holy expectation in eternal life. Paul told us in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. He also told us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. We are given the spiritual law that if we will suffer for Jesus, then we will experience the power of his resurrection, both in this life and after we pass through death's door. This world is only the shadow lands that gives us a dark outline of the real and eternal world. We need to ask God for spiritual eyes that can see into eternity so that we are defined by the real and eternal world, rather than this temporal, changeable world that's suffering under the curse of sin. After sharing with the disciples what was soon to happen to him, Jesus began to teach some necessary truths on what it means to be one of his followers. Mark recorded in chapter 8, verse 34, that Jesus called the people unto him with his disciples also. The Lord wants everyone to learn these truths, saved and unsaved alike. To the saved, this teaching is foundational to their walk with God, and for the unsaved, is a path to salvation that teaches them that there is a cost to discipleship. The Lord was once again forcing the people to examine themselves to determine if they were going to follow him no matter what they faced, whether times of suffering, temptation, persecution, blessings, growth, or prosperity. The truths Jesus shares are radical, and they are non-negotiable conditions that apply to everyone who wants to be a disciple and to make heaven their eternal home. We have this natural tendency to water down the Savior's teaching because we don't want to live out its radical implications. Many self-professing Christians use the grace of God in his excuse to not live out the truth, and this is a major deception that has crept into the church today. 
What Jesus commanded those first disciples to live out is what he commands us to live out today. The conditions have not changed. Failure to live out these truths results in separation from God that produces the eternal consequences of damnation. Now let's look at the first conditions of discipleship that Jesus taught, and this is found in verse 23. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The first thing we need to see is that this is an absolute statement. This is something that we must do daily, and there are no exceptions offered. We don't like such absolute statements because we want to think that our situation is unique, which grants us a license to not live according to the truth. I have seen this countless times, and one expression of this is over the sin of fornication. Take, for example, a man and woman living together outside of matrimony. The Bible clearly teaches that those who live that way will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yet many people claim that they have unique conditions so that they don't have to obey God's commands. But this is utter deception. They may claim financial distress and that they can't survive outside of that immoral relationship, but that doesn't change the reality that this is sin and rebellion. Or maybe they claim that since they have lived together so long that they are the same as being married, even though the Word of God says otherwise. Others make excuses that revolve around health issues. Then you have the popular senior excuse for practicing fornication by stating that if they get married, they will lose some of their retirement or Social Security. This means that they love their money in retirement more than Jesus. Whatever the excuse, they are all damnable because according to God, there is no justifiable reason for it. They are hostile to him and his law. If we love anything or anyone more than Christ, and this includes our own life, then we aren't serving God but an idol of our own creation. Also notice that Jesus spoke of people's own free will by stating, if anyone would come after me. This reveals that people have a free will to choose to walk with God or not, and that the common teaching on predestination is false. People can argue against their free will if they want to, but it won't change the fact that Jesus said, if anyone would come after me. He didn't say that they must come after him or that they had no choice whether or not they would follow him, but he plainly puts the responsibility of following him upon us. Because of what we do, which comes out of who we are, we are answerable to God and will receive our just reward, whether death and damnation or life in heaven. After Jesus showed us that we must make a choice to follow him, he laid out three conditions of discipleship, which are to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and then follow him. We will look at these in turn, but we need to understand that they are all tied into each other, so that if we fail to live out one, then we aren't living out the other two. The first requirement is that we must deny ourselves, but what are we to deny ourselves of? I think this is a very important question to answer. Jesus doesn't give us a list of what we are to deny ourselves of so that we can be a true disciple. This means that we must look at what Jesus required of his apostles and disciples to understand this. If we begin with the obvious, then we must deny ourselves anything that keeps us from loving and obeying God. Well, that's pretty simple to state. Then we must deny ourselves anything that keeps us from properly loving others. Now we see that this is attached to both the first and second commandment. There's no need to deny ourselves of those things we already hate or dislike. I hate Brussels sprouts and asparagus, so I don't have to deny myself them since I refuse to eat them. To deny ourselves implies that there's something we love or are attached to that needs to be given up so that we can walk with God and accomplish His will. This includes the putting off of our natural affections towards what we might consider the good things of life, but our hindrances in serving God like we should are fulfilling His will. These may be pleasures, wealth, comforts, honor, family, and anything that would keep us from fully obeying the will of God. In Romans chapter 15, verse 3, Paul wrote on Jesus being our example in this matter. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insulted you have fallen on me. The prior two verses give application to the verse I just read. We who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. To love others like Jesus loves us, we must deny ourselves, for self-love is always hostile to selflessly loving others. From this we can see that love according to God's standard is selfless and sacrificial, never selfish or self-seeking. The biblical truth is an utter opposition to the pop on biblical teaching on love that comes out of the majority of pulpits in this nation.
all of the supposed woke preachers of our day are hassled to Christ in the sound teaching of the Word of God. Their popularity doesn't mean that they are preaching the truth, and many people are deceived by this. Integral to the breakdown of every marriage is the fact that the husband and wife refuse to deny themselves so that they can selflessly love their spouse. Whenever people abandon the truth of Scripture to teach, preach, and propagate that which is contrary to sound doctrine, it's always going to feed the flesh life and bring ruin to our relationship with God and others. The second criterion to be a disciple of Christ is to take up our cross. Though this is similar to denying ourselves, it's a stronger and more radical thought. Crucifixion was only considered by the people of that day as a judgment from God. Paul expressed this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one who is hung on a tree. Paul was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, which is a prophecy about the mode of execution that didn't exist when that prophecy was given. For Jesus tell his disciples and potential disciples that they had to pick up their cross to follow him would have had them looking at Jesus with mouths hanging open in astonishment. They weren't looking to follow Jesus so they could be cursed by God. They wanted his blessings, not judgments. But here's the clincher. Whatever we are to crucify is already cursed by God. So we need to nail it to a cross since they are hostile to God. Jesus never told us to be kind to our sin nature or the sins we practice. That which is evil can't be redeemed. It must be crucified. It must die. The Lord won't redeem lust, hate, greed, pride, and so on. They are evil and contrary to everything God is, so they must be crucified. Only out of death to self and sin can we experience Christ's resurrection life and power. A vast number of self-professing Christians live defeated lives because they refuse to die to the sin that so easily besets them. The final non-negotiable aspect of true discipleship is to follow Jesus. And this can't be done unless the prior two requirements are fulfilled. It's easy to say that we will follow Jesus until, that is, we come face to face with the biblical Jesus and understand the cost of true discipleship. Salvation is absolutely free, but discipleship costs us everything. We can't live in God's salvation if we refuse to be a disciple according to God's standards. It has always been, and it will always be, all or nothing. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill.